Thank you everybody for joining um, and thank you so much to our BSL interpreters for being here today. It's really nice to have you here for um, our first session um, in the Scholar Series uh, with BSL interpreters, so thank you. I feel like that's enough from me for now. Uh, Khadija, I know you've got an amazing session planned, so I'm going to uh, leave it to you to take it away. Hi everyone, um, just to quickly introduce myself, I'm Khadija Diskin, I'm a researcher, um, I lecture um, and I'm interested in race, its history, I'm interested in how we can create imaginative possibilities, how we think about the project of emancipation historically and in the current moment. Um, and the current moment is, is a very interesting time uh, because I feel as though it's a time where a lot of radical language is quite popular, exists quite significantly within the public consciousness, but the actual radical action that's meant to follow the terms, meant to follow the language, um, is somewhat missing. Um, so I, I began to kind of explore why, um, to think through why these words that held so much power, held so much meaning, have very specific purposes, are being used without their purposes actually being mobilized. Um, and that's led to myself and Martha unpacking and discovering and exploring a range of language that is used within the anti-racist kind of circles. Um, we've looked at privilege, why, you know, severely debunked privilege to help us understand what privilege is, what its purpose was and why it was never meant to be a totalizing analysis or a totalizing thesis of anything. We've also looked at race. Um, where a lot of commonly held assumptions about what race is were necessary to challenge. Um, and I offered some interventions on what race actually is, because we often think race is being a skin color, but race is so much more than that. Um, we've also talked about allyship um, and the problem with allyship, looking historically at the context of, you know, movements for emancipation that had a coalition of people working towards a particular goal, how those movements got destroyed and what allyship has become in the current moment, whereby we see a very individualized kind of concept of allyship, a very interpersonalized concept of allyship that isn't breaking us beyond the individual to think about the collective and the community and think about what solidarity means in action. Um, today, I'm really excited to be taking on the task of discussing intersectionality. Um, I've spoken about it before. Um, an interesting thing about me is I remember I heard that Kimberly Crenshaw in I think it was 2016 um, was going to be lecturing at LSE and I quickly changed my master's program and decided to go there because um, I wanted to be taught by her I wanted to learn from her and you know that that experience was quite transformative um, being able to understand and think through what the actual genealogy of intersectionality is is really important so I guess in this conversation um, and I've got a presentation for you that I'm going to show um, shortly. I'm not necessarily trying to debunk intersectionality. I'm trying to debunk the ways that intersectionality has become attached to other forms of political thought, other sometimes problematic ideas about what identity means and what we mean by oppression. Um, and what I'm hoping to do is really situate and locate intersectionality in its history and in its context. Um, and also use some of the words of Crenshaw herself, who has been quite, you know, frustrated at the way this thing that she coined has transformed from its roots, has been removed from its context, and is now being used as this everyday linguistic and rhet rhetorical device um, that meant something. But right now, we, we're really not sure what it means. I'm also going to talk about how a lot of the commonly assumed things that we think about intersectionality actually come from other concepts. So there are concepts that name specific things that we call intersectionality, but because the history of a particular school of thought that emerges from a lot of black feminist thought has been lost somewhat and intersectionality has become the totalizing thesis and the totalizing kind of image of the canon of black feminism, people have lost some of these other analysis. So hoping to reintroduce them to you. Um, and they're terms that you use, terms that you think, but you probably just didn't have the name for it or knew who coined them or who mobilized it in a particular way. So I'm going to be hopefully helping people to learn the terms that they're using come from a particular place and have a particular meaning and also learn the words um, to be able to use those analysis. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and hopefully this goes smoothly. I'm hoping that everyone can see my screen. Yes. Brilliant. So I've entitled um, this little masterclass as 
intersectionality, ending oppression Olympics. And the reason I've coined it this is because I think in a lot of how I see people use intersectionality, there seems to be this overarching idea that intersectionality is telling us that the more oppression you have, or the more identities you have that may be marginalized, the more oppression you have. When that's never really been the case, um, that's never been what intersectionalists try to say. But there are other schools of thought that tell us about the multitudes of oppression, and we're going to discuss them. But firstly, I want to lead with a provocation. Um, and I want everyone to who feels comfortable to share in the chat just what you think, um, what you, you feel when you use the word intersectional. What do you mean when you say you are intersectional? What does an organization mean when it says it is in intersectional? Um, this isn't an attempt to catch you out, just attempt to get a feel for the way that we use this language to tease out the parts of it that are correct and the parts of it that perhaps need a little bit more development. So in the chat, just share it. I'm not gonna read any of them out. Um, I just want to be able to see how people are coming to this with an understanding of, inter of what, is, what it means to be intersectional. I'm gonna give you guys a few minutes um, to, to get feeling a little brave um, to share your ideas. Interesting. I'm liking what I'm seeing. Okay, so the concept of multiple identities often comes up when we talk about intersectionality, and it does for a good reason. Um, and the uniqueness of experience I see also coming up quite a lot. Yeah, so thinking inclusively. So a lot of the responses here are, you know, quite honestly, what a lot of people think about when they think about intersectionality. Um, that notion of difference, that notion of multiple identities, that notion of intersecting or interlocking identities is, especially in the context of Europe, I find how people tend to think about intersectionality. And there's nothing wrong with thinking this way. Um, there's a lot of organizations that have done good work in mobilizing this particular idea of what intersectionality means. Um, and that's all important. Okay. I like the idea of a junction where two things collide or come together. It's really interesting. So I want us to talk about some of the aims of today, just so everyone knows. Um, so my aim for today and the aim for everyone, I suppose, is to intervene and reinforce what intersectionality actually is. To debunk some of the common misuses of the term intersectionality. To offer some alternative language to commonly misused language around the intersection. And to perhaps decolonize the intersection, because the intersection has become such a dominant part of the Western canon, but we seldom think about the effects this has on other forms of scholarship, on other forms of thought. So to start off, um, I want us to think about where does intersectionality come from? So a lot of the time when we mention intersectionality, you often mention it adjacent to feminism or an attachment to feminism. And it's often ascribed to the black feminist tradition, the black feminist canon, as this intervention on white feminism. Uh, but this is a misunderstanding of, of what intersectionality is. Intersectionality was never an intervention on the political ideological movements that made about a type of feminism. Black feminism as a revolutionary project, as a project of thinking through 
the experiences of race when it collides to gender precedes um, intersectionality, long precedes intersectionality. Black women, women of color, women who experience racialized and gendered marginality had been talking about their experiences, had been specifying the uniqueness of their experiences long before intersectionality came into the canon. Um, and the black feminist canon rather than intersectionality as an analysis was the intervention into white feminism's inability to articulate the racialized experiences that create a type of gendered experience. Um, and the notions of a multitude um, of oppressions, of specific oppressions through the overlapping of identity exist prior to Crenshaw's intersectionality. And as I mentioned, was a hugely popular method of organizing for black women and women of color who wanted for liberation. So this notion of intersecting identities as attached to intersectionality is not necessarily the emergence of that particular analysis, right? That analysis predates intersectionality. Um, and intersectionality's genealogy is actually not from feminist studies. It's not from feminist political projects. It's not necessarily from black feminism in and of itself. It actually owes its genealogy to the interventions of critical legal studies, which then led to a critical race studies. So Crenshaw was a student of Derrick Bell, one of the founders of critical race studies or critical race theory. And critical race theory was an intervention on critical legal studies. So before the intersection, there are some languages that we use um, that we think means intersectionality, but doesn't. So triple oppression, the notion that because of a race and gendered and class-based position, one experiences multiple opp oppressions, concentration of oppression actually comes from Claudia Jones. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Claudia Jones's project. We also have the concept of a matrix of domination. Now the matrix of domination speaks to, to, to the societal creation of oppression, the lived experience of people who are oppressed and the way that those, that lived experience can organize itself around a matrix. And in this matrix, you have the overlapping and intersecting of particular marginalities. And then we have Angela Davis, who wrote Women, Race and Class, which was an attempt to look at the material realities of women who face gendered and racialized oppression by looking at the entire history of women's liberation and women's enslavement, women's domination, and speaking to and, and making a critical intervention about the way race, gender and class shape the lives of people and have material consequences so economic consequences, consequences that relate to the ability or inability to access resources. This was um, Angela Davis's intervention, which again precedes um, and, and was more popular in its inception than, than Crenshaw's project. So let's talk about firstly, Claudia Jones. Um, so in, in an essay penned, um, I think in 1949 called An Emancipatory Politics for All, Claudia Jones elucidated what this notion of triple oppression was. So on the onset of the Cold um, War, and Claudia Jones was one of those who organized with the Communist Party um, and with communist politics re, um, writ large, reassessing their priorities, Claudia Jones intervened to highlight the plight and the wide apathy often towards the specific experiences of black women and black women workers um, and a lot of the inability to talk about the specificities of a racialized and gendered oppression within the lens of a class-based analysis was incredibly frustrating for, for Claudia Jones. And many leftist circles, many people who thought of themselves as progressive completely ignored that specific experience of black women. Um, and she articulated through this logic, through this term, triple oppression, the complex history of black womanhood, the burden of being a familial garden, um, guardian and protector, whilst also an exploited worker, and whilst also experiencing racist violence from the state. This was a triple oppression. 
right? Because it was beyond gender, it was beyond um, class, and it was beyond race as individual entities. It was the combination of those things that created this intersection, this layering of oppression that was concentrated towards Black women. And the intervention Jones makes actually is not simply that triple oppression is a specific experience of oppression, but rather that if we understand how race modifies gender, how race modifies class, how class modifies gender, how class modifies race, that we can begin to imagine a project of emancipation for Black women. Because a lot of the popular discourse on womanhood at the time completely ignored the fact that for many Black women, working or not working was not a choice. Black women who were enslaved had to work. They weren't offered the luxury of a particular upper-class femininity that deemed womanhood outside of the labor force. Black women were always workers. Black women were always carers. Black women were always fighting for liberation and emancipation from their oppression. And so if we could follow the lead of Black women who understood gender, understood race and understood class, not as additives, but as constituents of how our lives are shaped, then we're able to get a better idea of what the imagination we need for liberation looks like. I'm just gonna hold there for a little bit. So the notion of oppression actually overlapping comes from Claudia Jones's interventions on triple oppression. And of course, this has been expanded too. So we're talking about Claudia Jones's project, which was in the 1940s, um, which was at a particular time in history where there were particular ideas of societal structures that were either ignored or were at the forefront. So following this notion of triple, of triple oppression that Claudia Jones intervenes on within sort of the political movement, we then have Patricia Hill Collins. And I think this term, this analysis is actually the one that gets mistaken for intersectionality the most. Um, and it's the one I think that is incredibly useful for understanding systems of oppression, but oftentimes we think it's what intersectionality is, but not actually that is, this was created and coined by Patricia Hill Collins, who has inspirations from other black feminist leaders to understand the notion of the matrix of domination. So for Hill Collins, oppression is produced through the societal conditions and context that produce this experience. So here, the matrix of domination is the language we use about a white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchy that is ableist, um, that is heteronormative. That's where that language comes from. These are societal structures and they exist within a matrix formation. So they intersect and overlap. And actually the intervention that Patricia Hill Collins wants us to understand that it is people who experience these societal dominations that are able to tell us how this matrix works. And for her, the only way to truly understand the way systems are maintained and experienced is focusing on this word, this lived experience of those subjected to domination. So a lot of the language here that we use about lived experience, about focusing on marginal groups and highlighting their stories and understanding the complexity of their experience because of a variety of oppressive structures actually comes from the notion of the matrix of domination, which is what Patricia Hill Collins offers us as analysis. So domination exists in a matrix-like structure with people experiencing specific mobilizations of domination that become visible when we explore the dimensions of things like race, class, gender, ability, sexuality. And so the matrix of domination is actually what speaks to these structures in society that collude and produce domination. So in order, and according to Patricia Hill Collins, to truly understand domination, we have to listen to those who are experiencing those types of domination. And the point that Patricia Hill Collins makes too, um, exists as a critique of popular scholarship, of popular ideas, and of popular politics. Because within popular politics, a lot of the way that people conceived of race, gender, and class was simply through the lens of what existed within the academic canon. 
And the point that Patricia Hill Collins was making specifically about lived experience and the need to focus on lived experience to articulate and make visible the matrix of domination was that it is people with this lived experience who know the realities of their lives, who see the realities of, of, um, of discrimination. And the point was for Patricia Hill Collins that we move away from the way the traditional scholarship ignores these people and center the experiences of those that are marginalized. And that was an important intervention into the black feminist scholarship and the black feminist canon. So now we have Angela Davis's Women, Race and Class. In 1981, um, in Angela Davis's 1981 text on women, race and class, she wanted to look at the history of womanhood, the histories that create a particular experience of womanhood that can be looked at as a sort of racialized and gendered um, marginality. Um, and in this text, she historicizes the specificities of women's oppression and movements for liberation against that oppression. Um, she was really interested in exploring the material consequences of identity. So not simply how identity is experienced on an individual level, the consequences experiencing racial and gendered marginality have for people, the economic consequences, their ability to lack resources, the inability to have things like proper education. Um, and her interventions were that race, class, and gender were not additive parts of an experience, but constitutive parts of a larger material reality, meaning a larger real kind of interaction and reality of oppressed people. So for Davis, the persistence of race, class, and gender needs to be understood as part of the necessary functioning of capitalism, which mobilizes categories of distinction for the purposes of exploitation in different ways. So now we come to intersectionality and its um, beginnings, if you like. So the emergence of intersectionality, um, as I've mentioned already, comes from critical race theory because Crenshaw was a critical race theorist who studied under Derek Bell, one of the founders of critical race theory, who made critical interventions on critical legal studies. Um, and their interventions sought to create a greater clarity and analysis of the way that the judicial system in the US normalized racist assumptions and mobilized racist judicial policy. So within her engagement as a legal scholar, there were three important cases which emerged which highlighted that whilst racial clarity existed, there was a lack of clarity on other forms of marginality that I'll elucidate. So the particular case that I'm gonna focus on today was um, de Graffriand and General Motors. Um, and in this case, there were a group of black women who attempted to go to court and take their employer to court because they had all been fired from their job. Now on the outside, General Motors said they did nothing wrong, said that even though all the people we fired happened to be black women, we're not racist, we're not sexist, we like engaged in this policy on a particular basis and it wasn't because of racist assumptions and it wasn't because of sexist assumptions. So the reason why this policy actually targeted black women when we look at it is that before 1964, General Motors hired no black, black women at all. So there were black men in the organization, there were white women in the organization, but it hired no black women at all. Um, after 1964, it did hire black women, but because of how seniority was structured within their organizational and institutional structure, whereby seniority operated on the basis of how long you worked there and you were able to work up towards a senior position. During a recession, when they decided to hire people, um, fire people and fire the last hired people, all those who were affected by this policy happened to be black women. So the interesting thing about this case is when these black women took this case to the judicial courts to make the case for the fact that they'd been discriminated against, the judicial system did not recognize their specific protected characteristics. 
because they couldn't argue that General Motors was racist because it still had black men, but the, and they couldn't argue that General Motors was sexist because it still had and employed white women. The legal system did not recognize the specificity of race and gender in that specific context as creating the possibilities for the exclusion of black women. And this was because of the historic policy that General Motors had in not hiring black women before 1964. And because the judicial system did not recognize race and gender as categories that could be experienced in unison, there was no justice to be awarded to these black women. Um, and the judge ruled that there was no protected class within the law for black women specifically who experienced a particular form of racialized and gendered experience. And because they couldn't prove that it was explicitly their gender or prove that it was explicitly their race, their case was thrown out and the injustice carried out to them was not considered. And this is why Crenshaw created the intervention of the intersection within the context of juridical policy and law. Because the legal system were treating black women as solely black or solely women, instances where there was a combination of those two issues um, became completely insignificant to them. And for a long time, the judicial system had completely ignored the specific um, issues affecting black women because of their incapability to think about race and gender as constitutive parts that create a particular experience or particular vulnerability within the law and within institutions. And Crenshaw states actually that intersectionality was a prism to bring light to the dynamics within discrimination law that weren't being appreciated by the court. So here we see that intersectionality had a specific purpose, had a specific aim and was located in a specific context. I think these interventions on intersectionality are really important because I think as people who engage in the project of emancipation, who want to think about freedom, who want to think about oppression, we oftentimes give a lot of credit to particular language, particular analysis and particular movements that hadn't actually considered a lot of these things. Um, I've seen a lot of the comments that people are asking about disability as being included within the matrix of oppression. Now, I think it's important for us to be honest um, as scholars and honest about the history of a lot of scholarship that actually did not take into account other forms of oppression that we now recognize are just as significant and important in shaping the lives of people. So a lot of this canon absolutely had blind spots in and of itself. And so when we think about these analysis and we think about these concepts, it's important to always try to stretch them. It's important to always try to push them past what they initially are trying to look at because they're analytical methods, they're not necessarily a fixed ideology or belief system. So we can change them, we can use them differently. If we recognize that disability is a significant issue, is a significant structure in society that causes marginality, then of course we can ask for not just triple oppression, I think that's too simplistic, or even just an idea of a white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, but also recognizing that a white supremacist capitalist patriarchy is embedded within an ableist patriarchy, within an ableist capitalism, within an ableist um, imperialism. And all these things are constitutive parts of creating marginality. So now to move on to what is an intersectionality? Um, and I put this here because again, like I said, a lot of people use language that has meaning. Things like the matrix of oppression, I think is far more helpful and far more useful for thinking about structures and centering the lived experience of people who are subjected to structures of domination and oppression than intersectionality is. Because intersectionality is actually just about looking at and visibilizing something that was happening that was disregarding others. So what is an intersectionality, I think is an important question. Well, it isn't an ideological project. It's not a belief system. It's not something that 
you know, we necessarily should attach to ourselves as an identity. It's an analysis and it's a limited analysis. It's an analysis that had a particular home that was created at a particular time. So it's not perfect and it's not going to be the totalizing answer we need to truly think about how oppression is experienced and is lived. Um, it's not the compilation of identities as additive too. Actually, intersectionality, as Crenshaw articulates, is an exploration of the intra-group differences that exist within an already marginalized population. So when we're doing intersectionality, we're not just overlapping identities, we're looking at a marginal community, looking at how the dominance of a particular idea of marginality can invisibilize another idea of marginality. So in the case of, for example, race, when race was thought of as a totalizing experience that didn't have variation, that didn't have nuances, the experiences of black women were not considered. The experiences of queer black people, for example, were not considered. The experiences of disabled black people oftentimes are not considered. So when we look in these macro structures and macro identities in society, what intersectionality can offer us is a need to look closer at marginal groups. It's not necessarily add identities or you know, view identities as inherently additive. And Crenshaw makes this intervention herself. And intersectionality also isn't a personal choice, right? It's not something that necessarily we can attach ourselves to individually. It's a, a, a political project of source and a scholarly project. And I think when I make these interventions on intersectionality, the, the, the thing I'm trying to problematize for people is that this thing came from a particular space within scholarship. It was imperfect in its initiation, but when we take it outside of its context as a policy and judicial based analysis that sought to look at a particular case and visibilize a particular experience under law and extrapolate that and, you know, mobilize that in our everyday usage of the terms, what we can sometimes miss is that it's an imperfect thing, right? Um, and I think it's also important to kind of intervene that intersectionality is not necessarily a feminist project. In the initiation of the intersectional analysis that Crenshaw particularly offers, it wasn't a necessarily feminist project. It had feminist potential. And of course, it highlighted the experiences of women, which we know is, you know, important. But it, as an analysis, is not in and of itself a feminist project or a feminist tool. If we understand it as a scholarship, uh, an analysis of law, uh, we see that it's not necessarily a political project, so it cannot necessarily offer us a liberatory framework, it just offers us an ability to look at a particular circumstance. And I also think that it's important to intervene that it isn't an assumption of privilege, the, intersex the intersection isn't to say that those within an intra-group, those who experience additional marginality within a larger social group, you know, are necessarily in competition with others. No, it's just specifying different experiences of marginality. And difference does not necessarily mean that someone is less privileged or someone has more power. We can talk about the differences that exist for disabled people without pitting disabled people against each other without saying someone has more than the other. We can talk about difference, we can talk up and be specific, and being specific also doesn't discount the experiences of other people. It just allows us to know more clearly and see more clearly what's happening in a particular circumstance. And I think that within our wider projects of sort of political thought um, and racial literacy and literacy on all forms of oppression, it's really important for us to understand that when we, when we talk about something, when we focus on one thing, that's not to discount the other. When we are specific about a particular experience, that's not to deny a different experience. And that's never to pitch these experiences against each other as necessarily competing. Something I always say is that the systems of oppression that affect our lives discipline all of us. They discipline all of us in different ways, but they discipline all of us. So we are all subjected to white supremacy. We are all subjected to patriarchy. We are all subjected to the logics that dictate ableism and make it a part of our society. We are all subjected to class-based oppression in different ways, but it's a disciplining mechanism. Um, 
and intersectionality again and I think an important one is that it's not simply a lived experience of marginality um it's an analysis but it's not in and of itself marginality so the matrix of oppression is what actually focuses on lived experiences of marginality the notion of multiple oppressions dual triple quadruple oppression is what shows us this overlaying and overlapping but intersectionality itself has never really claimed to do that project so that's never really been its aim so to kind of finalize my talk because i feel like i've been talking for a long time um what actually is intersectionality then and how do we do it so intersectionality and it's important to recognize its history and its genealogy is an analysis born in the judicial scholarships in the USA that highlighted the contradictions of race and gender and aimed to make visible the consequences of insufficient gender analysis or insufficient racial analysis within the legal discipline. And we can stretch this to within policy um, and governmental policy specifically oftentimes. Um, it's an analysis of the invisibilities present within societal categories of oppression, with the emphasis being on visibilizing difference and specificity, not creating hierarchies. And it's also more importantly, a, an interrogation of state mechanisms, of policy, of jurisprudence, of institutional action, um, of the way in which institutions organize and mobilize and recognize oppression. It was never really meant to be an individualized form of analysis. It's a analysis that looks at larger structural topics and larger institutions in the world. So when we think about intersectionality, when we go about our day-to-day -day uses of the word intersectionality, I think it's helpful and it's useful to think about the other language that could be far better useful, um, far, that could be a far better use for us to understand the complexity of oppression. And that's not to say intersectionality in and of itself is useless, absolutely not. Um, but it is to say that there is a world of thought and there is a world of language and there is a world of analysis that exists. And because intersectionality is currently part of the canon, that doesn't mean that it's a totalizing thesis of everything. And Crenshaw says that herself. It was specific, it meant something, and it has a particular process and procedure an analysis um, and we should respect that and we should never try to give things or put, um, you know expect too much of language and analysis especially language and analysis that comes from you know you know academia um, and that's something that I think I need to be more critical of too because academia is an imperfect space academia is also a space where domination happens um, so for me I prefer the matrix of oppression because I think that because of its inherent focus on the complexity of social structures and the lived experience of people at the heart of experiencing that marginality, it offers to us a lot more. Um, and I recommend everyone who's interested in intersectionality, um, interested in learning more about it, to read Patricia Hill Collins's work on Black Feminist Thought, to also read a book she wrote on intersectionality where she makes these interventions and it's a little bit actually scathing of Crenshaw for taking credit for something that she didn't really create um, and citing the long history of women, women of color, who've tried to get us to stretch our analysis of the complexities of people's lives and oppression beyond, you know, even the categories of race, class and gender. Um, so that's it from me. Um, I'll make sure that this PowerPoint is available to anyone. Um, and just finally, there are some um, thoughts that I kind of mentioned that I want to kind of cite for you, um, other than the ones that I cited and talked about. And this is some great articles, um, The Matrix of Domination, which is by Marjorie L. DeVault, who talks about Patricia Hill Collins's contribution. Um, there's a brilliant article written by Denise Lynn, which talks about Claudia James's project and her interventions on a lot of the politics of the time. Um, and The Intersectionality was by Jane Coaston, which is really good for you know, hearing from Crenshaw herself, her frustrations with what's happened with intersectionality um, and the misunderstandings of intersectionality um, and why sometimes it's problematic when academic terminology leaves, it ho leaves its home, enters the lay world um, and it's kind of used rhetorically without a critical kind of idea about where it comes from and its inherent limitations. 
Um, so that's been it for me. Um, I'm sorry for talking um, to you all for so long. Um, and yeah, happy to kind of field through questions now. This was recorded from a live event where we uh, went on uh, to have quite an in-depth discussion between Martha and Khadija and the audience about intersectionality, particularly how it relates to the charity sector. We run events like this regularly, trying to demystify and better understand various terms that are used within anti-racism. So keep an eye out on our Twitter and our website to see what events we'll be running next and to take part in the discussion yourself.